that's certainly okay with me. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate what you do, and it's a tough job. Not unlike the job that I'm going to describe here today. I remember very vividly um, the first time I saw the piece of land on which Judy and I live now. I was driving through the countryside. We'd been down visiting our relatives in East Texas, and I saw this little sign that said, House at 20 Acres for Sale, a little bitty small sign. And I remember pulling up in there with Judy, and we looked the place over, and I remember saying, we're going to buy this place. And she said, there's no way we can afford this. And uh, anyway, it was sort of my you know, goal. I set myself a goal to find out a way to muster the funds to buy this little place. I really wanted to be back down here in East Texas. The church was my, one of my primary reasons for coming back because um, I knew a lot of the people here and um, I grew up here, my hometown. My dad was still here and getting, getting elder, elderly at that time and uh, um, I didn't know he would live 16 more years. I told him one time, I said, you're the only guy I know that got all of his Social Security back from the government because you paid it in for so many years and then you lived for 30 years after you retired. So, But I remember looking at that old place and the, pl and the weeds were growing up and the house needed work. And the barn had part of the roof blown off. And I was thinking, man, this place needs a lot of work. We, had, we did end up finding, uh, I remember taking a little map of that place and pinning it up on my desk in Dallas there at work and saying, that was like my motivation every day. I'd come in and look at that little map. No one else knew what it was. But that was my motivation for buying, eventually buying this thing. And over the course of several years, you know, we did move into there and we remodeled the house. We cleared the fences. We mowed the pastures. We repaired the barn. We painted. We did everything to this place. It seemed like there was no stopping point. And I guess to some degree we're still working on it. It's a nice place and we love it. I tell you this story because it reminds me of some of what Jeremiah had to say to the nation of Judah, his own country. What he saw the condition it was in, and what he knew God thought about what was happening in their land and to its people. It was in a state of disrepair. It needed a lot of work. And Jeremiah thought that the people were up to the task of repairing it. But to his disappointment, he would find out that they were not. Jeremiah was a man who loved his country. He was a young man when he was called. Some believe that he may have been 20 years old when he was actually called. Of course, the scripture tells us that God knew him when he was in the womb. He had made these plans for Jeremiah. He was called to the, his assignment, as I said, in his early 20s. And in Jeremiah, the first chapter, it says... Before I formed you in the belly, verse 5, I knew you, and before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. And, of course, Jeremiah, being such a young man, said, I, I, Oh, Lord, I, I can't speak. I'm, I'm too young. I'm a child. And God said, Don't say that you're a child. He said, I will send you, and you'll do whatever I command you to speak. That will you will speak. Be not afraid of their faces. Look at verse 8. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So it tells me that Jeremiah had sort of a shy countenance, maybe not unlike Moses and Joshua. I don't know if Joshua did, but certainly Moses was called the meekest man that ever lived. And I believe Jeremiah had that same countenance. He says, and the Lord put forth his hand and touched his mouth, and the Lord said, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have sent you this day. I have this day sent thee over the nations. Look at these. There's two things that God tells Jeremiah in this chapter. I have sent you over the nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it? When I look at these 
descriptions here, and I put them down on a piece of paper here, and I tried to think of scriptures or look up scriptures that might tell me what these words mean here. God had given Jeremiah some specific task that came with his calling. You know, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Jeremiah lived during, he, was, he began his ministry in the reign of the righteous king Josiah when things were good, when the nation was on top of the world. And that as he watched these next five kings, the, slowly, uh, the slow disintegration, if you will, of his nation, and you could maybe associate with maybe five presidents or something like that in your lifetime. You grew up as a child and you lived in a land when everything was prosperous, and then one by one, step by step, the nation be became worse and worse until it just absolutely fell into total ruin. That's happened to nations. As I said, God gave Jeremiah some speci specific tasks which came with his calling to root out. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, you don't have to turn there, I'll just quote, to, quote this to you. Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. So that gives you an idea of what Jeremiah's, part of what Jeremiah's job was. To pull down, that was another one. Well, to pull down what? In first, uh, 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So that gives us another little characteristic of what Jeremiah's job was. He, he says that he was to destroy. And in Matthew, the 3rd chapter, you remember what John the Baptist said. He said, and now is the axe laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That was total destruction. And it reminded me of this place when we bought this little farm or this little piece of acreage out here. How I had to go through and clear the fence rows and all these trees that had fallen over. And I worked several years on just old trees and my chainsaw, I wore out a couple of chainsaws and built these bonfires and I had bonfires all over that place at, at one year there. It seemed like every fall I had a big giant bonfire to go out there and burn and just cleaning up all these trees and unproductive limbs and sticks and, and trees. It reminds me of this scripture. But of course, in addition to Jeremiah's job, not only were these negative uh, characteristics, but also to build and to plant, to build the promise of a new nation, a new government. And, in, and I wrote out in my notes here, where will that be? Where will that new building occur? And to plant, of course, makes you think about a garden or maybe a vineyard. There's some uh, scriptures that talk about that. A bit, to plant a new people, a people who are actually obedient and faithful to God. And you might ask the question, who are they? And when will that happen? In verse 11, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I saw this rod of an almond tree. And there was a little bit of play on words here, but God in the, in the Hebrew that you don't see in the English, but it was a reference to this tree, which in Hebrew, the word sounds like haste. And God uses that play on words there. He says, I will hasten for I will hasten my word to perform it, perform what he has said he would do. And the word of the Lord said unto me a second time, saying, What do you see? And he said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. And the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. This seething pot was like a boiling pot of hot water. And it was a depiction of an army of war you got to handle it very carefully. I mean, it's, it's like destruction. For lo, I will call all families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem and against the wall thereof round about against all the cities of Judah. Talking about utter invasion, utter destruction coming. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Therefore, gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound you before them. Reminds me 
of several prophets. Actually, God said that to Isaiah. said, I'm going to make your head as strong as flint. He even told Ezekiel that. I'm going to make your head as adamant as a flint stone, hard as a rock. You, they're not going to be able to gainsay against you. So don't worry about their looks and the smirks and the downcast and the attitudes of people, the way they treat you. He said, now this is the second thing God gave Jeremiah. For behold, I made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar like a steel post, a brazen wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against their princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. The whole nation was going to be unable to speak against Jeremiah. And he said, they shall fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. You talk about a mouthful for a young 20-year-old to hear and to accept and to know. It must have terrified him. I believe it did probably on the beginning of this. You know, to realize, maybe he didn't realize the full scope of what his job entailed. I mean, it's like you got to think about what if God, through an angel, said to you, I want you to go to your nation, and I want you to go to the leaders of all the land, and I want you to give them this message from me. Boy, the thoughts start, the doubts, the fears, the, you know, the things begin to come through your mind. They're not going to believe me. They're going to think I'm a lunatic. And if I tell them, I, I got this message from God, Oh, well, you're just a laughing stock. You know what the outcome is going to be. You, I'm making a joke, and you're serious. You, you realize that's exactly what would happen. They'd laugh you out of the, you know, wherever you were. But he was to do it anyway. It didn't matter. That was Jeremiah's job. Is there any recourse for the people? In Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, I want to skip ahead here because... He made a reference here to this very, these very terms that he used of, of destroying and plucking up and building and planting. Look what he says in chapter 18. The Lord, uh, he sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house and he saw this potter making this vessel and he didn't like the one he made so he made another one. And God said, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Down in verse 6. And what instance shall I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? What does that mean? What does, what does God, does, does God have a right to do that? Look what he says. If that nation against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent of what? The evil that I thought to do unto them. That's what those terms pluck up, pull down, and destroy mean. It means God is sending vengeance upon that nation to tear it apart, to rip it up, to throw it down. I mean, when you throw something down, you're, you're done with it. You're, you, you, you have like a shovel with a broken handle. You throw it on the ground, you're like, that's a useless tool. I can't use that anymore. And what? And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, notice that term, a kingdom, to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I should benefit them. In other words, that tells you what building and planting is all about. It's goodness that God plans to do with a nation. So we see, I guess we get a little bit of a clue here of what God means by these terms here in this first chapter here of Jeremiah. In chapter 2, Jeremiah 2, why were these judgments to come up on the nation of Judah? Well, two, chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Has a nation changed their God, which is not yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. You know, and he asked the question like, Isaiah did and other of the prophets, you know, look out in the nation and see, do you see Buddhists? Did they change their God? They've been Buddhist for thousands of years. And what about the nation of Islam and some of these other third world nations that believe in their false primitive gods? 
They've been worshiping those gods for thousands of years. They haven't changed their God, but Israel, he accused Israel here of changing their God. Verse uh, 12, be astonished and heavy, O ye heavy he heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils, for they have forsaken me, and they've, which is the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they, for, they rejected God, and they went out after this religion that was an empty, vain religion. The very mention of God, as I said uh, a moment ago, in our society today, even by, and I re heard this yesterday while I was driving along, I had to go to Louisiana, work on a well over there, and I heard about this coach down in Florida who said a little prayer with his team. Well, they're on him now. You know, they've centered, they've got him in, his, in their sights. They want this separation of church and state. They can't have a coach praying for his team. It's abominable what's happened to our country. But they want to take God out of every aspect of our society. They don't want to have any Bible reading or Bible classes or even the mention of a Bible. I remember when I was a kid, we would, the teacher would read the Bible to us. That sounds so foreign now, doesn't it, to our society? What? A teacher reading the Bible? You're kidding. We don't want a teacher reading our kids the Bible. and We don't want any preachers in there. We don't want prayer in our schools. And we don't want prayer anywhere. We just want God to get out. Guess what? God may actually do that someday. It seems as though our nation is really inviting him to leave. In uh, verse 31, he, it says that they had forgotten God. He says, O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been in the wilderness unto, a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? God is asking, wherefore say to my people, we are, wherefore say my people. This is what they say to God. We are lords. We will, call no, we will come no more unto you. We don't need you. But God asks the question, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Can a... Can a a bride forget that she has on a wedding gown? But my people have forgotten me days without number. I tried to think this morning what it was like in 1969 and 1975 and 1981. How far back has it been? How far back was it when our country, for the vast majority of them, actually believed and worshipped and loved God and respected and obeyed Him. How long has it taken? In my lifetime, it's been a disintegration from the time of my childhood till now. And it probably began long before, if you consider the 1950s and the absolute <laughs> throwing to the wind of morals, values, and then certainly in the 1960s when I was only a child. But look where we've gone now. I, I, I shudder to think that my old grandmother, who was, I, I forget now, she died in 1980, I believe, 79 or 80. Lovely, sweet woman. It was my dad's mother, and she was the kindest, sweetest woman I ever knew. What she would think if she was resurrected and saw our country today and saw what's on television, I, she couldn't watch. She wouldn't be able to watch. She wouldn't be able to stand it. It would be so horribly embarrassing to her to see the horrible things we have. In Jeremiah 3, in verse 1, God said they had become like a harlot. You know, like an old, well, I won't get descriptive. A harlot, I guess, is the best way to leave that. He says, they say, if a man put away his wife and she go to him and become another man, shall he return her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with your many lovers, yet returned unto me again, says the Lord. He's sort of asking this question. You're going to go play the harlot, and then you're going to sweep through here and come back to me? Down in verse 6, he says, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. So this was very early on in, in Jeremiah's ministry. Have you seen that which backsliding Israel has done? 
They had the beautiful example of the tribes of Israel that were to the north of them. <clears throat> and they saw the history of Israel, how Israel, the northern tribes, had fallen into disrepair and, and fallen away from God and rejected God. And they actually saw and witnessed the northern tribes be carried away captive. They had that example of what happens to a nation. And yet, look at verse 10, for all this... Her treacherous sister Judah has not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly said, uh, saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. You know, they saw this example, and they didn't turn and repent to God. Look at verse 12. Go and pro proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, you backsliding Israel, says the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, merciful, says the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. God is asking them to repent, even though they were in the state or the condition they were in. Only acknowledge your iniquity. What does it mean to repent? It means that you have to go before God and you've got to confess every evil, rotten deed you ever said, done, or thought. You've got to give it all up. You've got to lay it out before Him and you've got to tell Him you are sorry for what you did. Not only personally, but as, as a country, as a nation, as a county, as a, as a state. We have to do that collectively before God, not not just personally, but, you know, it's like you can't eat an elephant but one bite at a time, as they say. You know, it takes one person making a change in their life, and then another person, and then another person, and before you know it, you got a whole county of people that really seek God, and maybe at some point a state or even a nation. He says, turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married unto you. It's like he's begging his wife to come back home, who's left. Look at verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. Well, these are, <laughs> these are tough words, aren't they, for a nation to hear? They were tough for Jeremiah to say, I'm sure, or right. I can, I can uh, attest to that because even standing up here reading them are difficult. When you know that you're talking perhaps to a nation of people that, that need to hear these words. They're, they're very difficult. Um, Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, verse 1. This begins the threat of God's judgment against the people. He says, I will, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return unto me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then shall you not be removed. Is actually the better translation. You won't be removed out of the land. And you sw shall swear the Lord liveth in, in truth and judgment and righteousness and the nations shall bless themselves in him and him shall they glory. He's saying if you'll turn to me, you're, all these wonderful blessings, you'll be praising God. You'll be saying what a wonderful land in which we live. God's truth and righteousness reigns. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break, break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest, I, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench because of the evil of your doings. Down in verse 5 he says, as I said, these are the beginning or the threats of the judgment of God. But I want you to look at what verse 5 through 7 says here. Declare you in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land, cry together, uh, cry, gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense city. Take up a defensive position because, he says, set up a standard toward Zion, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. Look at verse 7. This is what I wanted to get to here. Verse 7 says, The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. I really wanted to point that out here. It's interesting to me that God is threatening his judgment and the destruction upon their land 
But it's as if the destroyer or if judgment is already on the way. It's already coming. It's only up to the people to stop it from happening. Because God it sort of indicates here he's already sent it. And it will happen in, in a suddenly, you can read the rest of that chapter there, how he'll come in with these chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles, and woe unto us, for we're spoiled. That's what the people will say. And, of course, it was because of what was happening to the people in their heart. He, look at verse 18. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches unto your heart. These are the things that proceeded out of the heart. Of course, Jesus made, you know, he made a, he talked to his disciples about that when they were arguing about washing vessels and cups and, you know, a man eats a little bit of dirt and, got, and Jesus said, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the heart. Because out of the heart is what precedes murder and fornications and all these thefts and robberies and all these evil deeds that are in the heart of man. Those are the things that defile the man is what he taught his disciples. Jeremiah then laments over what he knows is about to happen in this verse 19 when he says, My bowels, my stomach, I am pained at my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Jeremiah can hardly take it. You know, it reminds me, you know, when you read the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel saw that roll there, God said, you see this roll? I want you to eat this roll that you see. And when he looked upon this, it was actually a scroll, like a book. He calls it a book, but it was a scroll. And it says what it, when he looked at the scroll, it was written within and without. But what was on it, it was covered with lamentation, mornings, and woe. It wasn't a nice bedtime story that he read. It wasn't fun reading the very outcome of the book. God's word is, you know, he describes God's word as being like honey when you eat it. When he ate the scroll, it was like honey in his mouth, but it made his stomach bitter. When you see the outcome of the God's word and you know what may happen to a nation, if they don't repent, it can be quite disheartening. And I believe it was to Jeremiah in his day. Uh, chapter 5, he asked if you could see, he said he wanted to look and see if he could find a righteous man. Look at verse 5 and verse 1, chapter 5 and verse, verse 1. Run you to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if you can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment that seeks truth, and I will pardon it. It reminds me of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah when God said he was coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moses said, if there's 50, can you, would you save that city? And God said for 50, and then it was 45, and then it was 40, and he got all the way down to 10 people. If there's 10 in the land, I will save it and not destroy it. And evidently, there weren't any, save for Lot. That was, and I, that were, there weren't 10, so God had no choice but destroy it. But he reached in and saved Lot at the last moment and his wife, who looked back. And, of course, two of his children two of his daughters. So God's judgment came upon that because there were no righteous people left in the land. When you look at the, this chapter 5, I'll, I'll just skip through these quickly here because of lack of time. He talked about adultery in the land. He said they're like fed horses in the morning. You know, if you ever raised horses, you'd understand that. Impiety, in other words, they look at verse 12. They have lied to the Lord and said, it is not he, neither shall evil, evil come upon us, neither shall we see the sword nor famine. This prophecy business about the end of the world and the end of our nation, that's a bunch of, you know, baloney, as they say. Don't be preaching that to us. We don't believe in that. That's never going to happen to us. I told a guy one time about, we were just having a general discussion. He said, do you realize the might of the United States of America? I said, yes, I do. I truly do. 
But God, if he executes judgment, it doesn't matter how strong an army or a navy or an air force you have. If he decides to bring down our nation, he can certainly do it. He says, he will bring a nation upon you, a house, O house of Israel, down in verse 15. It is a mighty nation, an ancient nation, a nation, a nation whose language you don't know. You don't know. You don't know how, what they're saying. They're, they're speaking this foreign language that you cannot understand. He talks about spiritual corruption uh, in chapter, uh, this same chapter here down in verse 23. He says, by this people hath revolt and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone, they've departed. Neither say they in their heart, let us fear the Lord, our God that gives us rain and the former latter in his season, and he reserves it unto us the appoint, appointed weeks of the harvest. They just completely disregard God, and they don't fear God in their heart. And you, if you don't believe me, just sit around and listen to some of the language sometime and how people will take God's name in vain like it's nothing. And, of course, the last one was civil corruption, which I believe is happening in our nation today. Look at verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. They like it when lies are told. They like it when deception is, is, is the, the, the uh, message of the day. And what will you do in the end thereof? Je Jeremiah, of course, gives his appeal over and over again. But finally he realizes that there's no, there's no hope for his nation. He's done all he can do. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet, by the way. If you've never heard that term, you look through the chapters of Jeremiah, and over and over again he talks about how he would weep and cry and lament for his nation because he didn't want to see what was coming upon his land because of the... He wanted his people truly to repent. I think he was a, a patriotic man. I didn't want only to pick up the warning message of Jeremiah today without including the good news of his address as well. It's a happier and a brighter side of this message, and it's one that should be included, I believe, for the hope of the people of God, number one, and for the hope of those who may have no hope, and perhaps for those who may have lost their hope. In Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, the wrath of God, um, this is one more, maybe one more chapter here that talks about the, you know, the, a time of Jacob's trouble. This is a chapter that talks about a time of Jacob's trouble. For lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. Notice they're paired together. When Jeremiah lived, Israel had already been carried away captive and Judah was yet to be captured. But God says that there's going to come a time when they're both going to be carried away captive. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and Judah. Ask now whether you see a man does travail with a child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loin as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned to paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that there is none like it, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. That was the point I wanted to make. It talks about a time of Jacob's trouble when Jesus said there would be a time of unprecedented horror that's happening on the world scene that if God didn't step in and intervene that every human being would be annihilated off the face of this earth. But it tells us that God is going to intervene. He's going to step in. He's going to save the nation of Israel. I believe it's in Isaiah. He says, eventually... Israel and Judah are going to be like one stick, one baton in his hand, ruling when he restores the nation of Israel. Let's look at a little bit of that. Uh, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, in verse 1. And at that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Look at that. Thus says the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I sent to ca uh, cause him to rest. The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. When you describe what God did for us by giving us his only son 
as the sacrifice for our sins when we didn't deserve it. I mean, you talk about the exemplification of the, uh, maybe the personification of love, of spiritual love God had for his people. It's astounding when you think of what he did for us. I don't think we spend enough time contemplating that very thought that the only reason we can stand here today is because of that sacrifice that God made by giving us his son. The Lord has appeared unto me of old, saying, He loved thee with everlasting love. And again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with tabrets, and you shall go forth in dances of them that are make merry. And you shall yet plant vines upon the mountains. We talked about those words about building and planting. Here he's talking about building and planting upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. Oh, let's see. Let's skip ahead. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them. These are the people returning. You get a little glimpse of the people that are coming out of captivity. And look what happens. He says, I'll gather them from the coast of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with a child and her that travails with child together, pregnant women. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping. And I... Yes, there probably will be at that time. Have you ever seen someone, have you ever watched some of these newsreel where the armies walked into the concentration camps and you look at the people's faces? I mean, what is it about the human reaction to something that they cannot believe is happening to them? You ever seen a, a, one of these soldiers return from war at a football game? And he'll walk out on that stadium and the mother or the wife will be there. And they are so in shock, they cover their eyes and they fall to the ground. They don't run and embrace the person. It's almost as if they cannot believe it's happening to them. I believe that's what's going to happen to these people. They're not going to believe that it's happening to them. That they're returning to their land, their home the place they loved. They can't believe they survived, perhaps. He says, they will, they will come with weeping and with supplication while I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in the straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. These prophecies here certainly talk about the the kingdom or the, the tribe of David, the, the lineage of David that would ultimately be a king in Israel. That the, these words here, we'll read that scripture maybe here in a moment, when it talks about that David be, will be the king over Israel. We know what the, you remember what the angel said to Mary, you shall, his name will be called Jesus. You know, when the angel appeared to her, he shall be great. He shall inherit the throne of his father, David. I believe that these scriptures in Jeremiah absolutely point to the fact that these kings or these king's daughters were removed from the land of Judah during their day and they were transplanted into the British Isles and they became the English-speaking peoples that we know today. But even if you don't believe that, and some people think that's a ridiculous idea, I happen to believe it with all my heart. I believe that I can prove it from the Bible because in the book of Isaiah it says that I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it will not, no more be overturned until he come whose right is, is to inherit this throne. And we read there, or we read in the book of uh, Luke, the first chapter, it says of Jesus that he will inherit the throne of his father, David, referring to these very scriptures here that we're reading here today. That God transplanted, he tore down that nation of Judah and he transplanted it and he's rebuilt it again with a new identity completely hidden from the world. And most, most of the world doesn't even understand those scriptures. 
but it certainly is talking about a time when Jesus will come at his, the second time and he will establish a government and a family here on this earth. And there's ample scriptures that prove that, that his feet will stand in that day up on the Mount of Olives, that we're, God has made unto us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. All of those scriptures talking about a new government under new rulership because this one that we have today, it's got a lot of problems. It's got a lot of repair that needs to be made to it. And I, like Jeremiah, I hope that our people have it within themselves to make those repairs. But I'm not sure if that will happen or not. And so Jeremiah, with the great trepidation and reservation because of his shy nature, went about to do the work of God and give the message of God to the nation of Judah. But they refused to listen, and destruction would and did come. It was a horrible thing for the prophet to witness the destruction of his nation, the destruction of his people, and the disillusion of the places and things that he held dear. The familiar and often neglected freedoms that we had, that they had, were now gone. It was sad indeed to realize the great blessings they once shared were now taken away by the same God who originally gave them those blessings. But it wasn't out of an unfair edict by God, but because of their own refusal to repent and to turn to Him with brokenhearted repentance. But they failed to acknowledge their provider, their creator, their sustainer, protector, and above all, the fountain of their salvation. Could it be that this event, recorded and lying here in the pages of this ancient document, were reserved for our day? And do they not warn our nations of their own sins and their own rejection of God? And are they here for the sole purpose of warning us and warning our nation that the exact perils will befall us unless we too fall down and repent before God and beseech his mercy to turn away from his fierce anger and his wrath, which must be already, which must be ready, I should say, to burst forth upon a rebellious land. You know what? We may not have to worry about freedom. It may be taken away from us. I guess that depends on whether our nation is willing to repent or not. One thing is for sure, it, hasn't, it won't happen because there was not a warning that went out. <laughs>